Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Jorgensen, and I am one of the legal advisors within the International Humanitarian Law Department. I want to welcome you all to this public webinar put on by the Red Cross IHL Dissemination Program. The IHL Dissemination Program serves to educate the public on, the interna on international humanitarian law and other areas that concern armed conflict. If you are interested in learning more about the work the American Red Cross does in IHL or how possibly you can get involved as one of our many volunteer IHL instructors, please contact your local Red Cross regional office. Today's event will concern the relationship between gender and IHL, and more specifically, it will focus on the, the the legal theoretical discussions happening in many academic circles. Our speaker today is Catherine Meyer. Catherine is a legal intern with the American Red Cross IHL team at national headquarters and an incoming third year law student at Cape Case Western Reserve University School of Law. If during the presentation you have questions, we do ask that you use the Q&A function to put those questions into, in there instead of the chat. We would also like to remind you that this event will be recorded. Thank you again for joining us. And without further delay, I will now pass it over to our speaker, Ms. Catherine Meyer. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today. Um, the aim of this presentation is to address and provide an overview of how women are treated under IHL or international humanitarian law, especially as the way we, as the law and the way we understand the law is always evolving. Um, discussions like these are incredibly important with aiding in that evolution. Additionally, as they come up, please feel free to put any questions in the chat. Um, so looking at women under IHL, although women have always generally played a role in armed conflict, the increase in the number of female participants in the Second World War, including as reservists, support units, and active combatants, really highlighted the variety of roles that women may play in armed conflict beyond the role of civilian. The role of women of, as combatants in particular comes with some societal discomfort. It's uncomfortable for many people to think about, but women can be just as capable as men of perpetrating violence. For example, women made up an estimated third of the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka and were incredibly effective suicide bombers in part due to stereotypes of women being vulnerable. Women are both voluntary and involuntary participants in armed conflict, and of course also experience armed conflict as civilians. Through these experiences, women in armed conflict can essentially be understood through two lenses. The first of these is protected, whether that's as mothers or from sexual assaults, uh, sexual assault, and as combatants or members of an armed forces or another armed group. Even as civilians, women are not passive actors in armed conflict and are not necessarily victims. The effect of war really depends and differs on the, depending on the role that each woman is playing. And it's important not to lose sight that when each person has specific needs, whether that's as combatants, uh, persons deprived of freedom, um, refugees, internally displaced persons, mothers and or civilians. It's also important to recognize these roles are not isolated. Women can and are many of these things all at once. So to clarify, focusing on women is not intended to negate the needs of men. Women and men form part of the same communities. So protecting women serves as a way of maintaining these communities, whether that's uh, protecting women as combatants um, or as civilians in conflict zones. Women also inherently experience conflict in different ways due to their culturally determined social roles. Supporting women who are at a heightened risk of marginalization, poverty, and suffering due to conflict does not serve to negate the needs of men, but rather serves to reduce foreseeable risks. Ultimately, by understanding and supporting the unique needs and experiences of women in armed conflict, it serves to sustain communities and ensure women are adequately supported post-conflict as well. So there are two feminist critiques of IHL. Here, just note that the use of feminist is in reference to the body of academic literature and school of thought, maybe not in the political way we're used to seeing feminist. So first, the enforcement critique. The enforcement critique argues that the rules protecting women are generally sufficient, but the failure is in their observation and the implementation by parties to conflict. 
This is the critique that's most often reflected in the work of the United Nations, including Security Council Resolution 1325, which calls upon all parties to armed conflict to respect IHL. This is also the view most reflected in the opinions of the International Committee of the Red Cross. For example, in a study done by the ICRC on women in conflict, the ICRC generally concluded that IHL was sufficient when adequately implemented. On the other hand, the revision critique questions whether IHL is actually suitable for addressing the rights and protections of women in armed conflict. This is not to say that it wouldn't be helpful if IHL was more consistently enforced, but rather that IHL must be revised to account for global systemic gender inequalities. For example, a focus on a need for privacy for women in particular may be a natural need, but it also might be a need that is effectively imposed by society, and it's important to be able to distinguish between the two. A major contributor to the revisionist critique of IHL, Judith Gardam has argued that while recognizing and accepting that there are limitations to IHL and the role of law, um, having an understanding of the endemic universal discrimination that exists against women should not continue to be overlooked and enforcement proponents must examine whether actually better enforcement would result in improvement for women. However, both of these critiques do recognize that the overall, that there is an overall lack of action to alleviate women's suffering during armed conflict. And both of them also recognize that women have these unique and diverse experiences during and after armed conflict. IHL is based on a concept of formal equality. Formal equality assumes that the sex of a person reveals nothing about the individual work um, or the autonomy and works to create a gender neutral legal order where women are treated like men or rather not worse than men. However, this also effectively treats sex as an abstract concept and fails to identify discrimination that may be specific in gender neutral or even gender specific statements. Uh, additionally, non-discrimination is enshrined throughout the conventions. Uh, in the first and second Geneva Convention, the convention specifically address non-discrimination by stating that there shall be no adverse distinction founded on sex. For an additional example, in the 1960 commentary to the Third Geneva Convention, Article 16, all prisoners of war are to receive the same standard of treatment, specifically non-discriminatory treatment. <clears throat> this commentary also states that the prohibition of discrimination is not incompatible with differentiation, whether that's on sex or rank, aptitude for work, age, or health. The commentary states that absolute equality might easily become injustice if applied without regard to considerations such as state of health, age, and sex. The principle of, in of equality must therefore be understood in a way that admits differentiation. This is also generally reflected in references to gender that uh, imply differentiation while promoting equality. Um, the third Geneva Convention Article 16 specifically requires consideration of rank and sex, health and age. Um, and both the additional protocols one and two prohibit adverse distinction based on sex. Adverse distinction also implies that there might be maybe um, a distinction made to give priority to those in most urgent near need of care. The ICRC has also noted that adverse distinction is part of customary international law and therefore applies in both international and non-international armed conflicts. Looking at formal equality through an enforcement perspective, the no adverse distinction rule illustrates how men and women are entitled to the same protections, while acknowledging that there may be circumstances where preferential or beneficial distinction for women is both permissible and needed. Under this critique, IHL is not intended to address issues of societal structure but rather focus on survival for as many people as possible. Additionally, although the focus is on formal equality, the recognition of special needs of certain classes of women, particularly pregnant women, mothers, and women at risk of sexual violence, shows how IHL can be used as a response to specific needs. Under the revision critique, formal equality ultimately fails to recognize that the actual underlying norm of equality is not neutral as it fails to recognize that women 
don't share the same experiences of armed conflict and are not able to avail themselves equally of the existing provisions due to systematic gender inequality. This failure of IHL to recognize systemic inequality reinforces discrimination by failing to address actual needs. Therefore, aside from special protections, women and their unique needs become effectively invisible. In either of these analyses, it's important to note that armed conflict tends to magnify pre-existing social inequalities. So in the same vein as the revisionist critique, there's also a corresponding push to look at equality in international humanitarian law through a substantive lens. Um, this is not focusing on similarities and differences between women and men, but identifying the patterns of oppression and subordination that women experience. This ultimately requires an understanding that sex discrimination originates in the longstanding inequality of women throughout most areas of their lives. The goal of a substantive equality lens is to transform the social patterns of discrimination, looking at gender, context, the nature and scope of benefits received, and the actual disadvantages experienced. However, this lens becomes problematic in view of the Geneva Conventions, as it ultimately requires each state to perform an examination of their underlying social inequalities, and as such might not actually be actionable in armed conflict. This lens also fails to recognize that there are cultural differences, which may result in removing the benefits that are actually important to retain, for example, protections for pregnant women. A rejection of formal equality in favor of substantive equality is common in human rights and can certainly be an effective tool, but it seems to fail to appreciate the need for a universality in IHL. Turning to the concept of women as protected, some scholars have argued that the development of conflict cultivates this narrative of the roles of men and women, reducing men to warriors and women to victims. For women, this effectively ignores their agency and entrenches male-dominated power structures. This narrative also reinforces the assumption that only men will perpetrate crimes of violence while simultaneously assuming that men will protect women. As civilians, certain women receive additional protections, uh, which are focused on women as mothers or as victims of sexual violence. While female and male non-combatants or persons not taking part in the hostilities, including combat medics, are protected under the broader civilian protections of the Geneva Conventions, this broad non-distinguishing policy that serves to protect civilians as a whole ignores the reality of female civilians in conflict who more limited freedom of movement, more care responsibilities, and exploitation. So under the principle of distinction, all civilians are protected from indiscriminate attacks. Um, although the broad targeting of civilians is prohibited under IHL, women are also more likely to be disproportionately impacted. For example, in Syria between 2011 and 2016, almost 71% of the conflict-related deaths were civilians. Looking specifically at aerial bombings and shellings, uh, these were the primary causes of death for women and children with approximately 75% of those killed by aerial bombs and shells being women. The deprivation of economic, social, and cultural rights in conflict also has a disproportionate impact on women, including house and property destruction or exploitation, withholding of humanitarian assistance, food shortages, which may be amplified by where cultural norms include women and girls eating last, a lack of adequate sanitary conditions and supplies, the loss of education, a lack of adequate health care, including reproductive care and increased care responsibilities. Although additional protocol one also forbids indiscriminate attacks, which are attacks that cannot be directed which are not directed at a specific military objective or which employ a method or means of combat which cannot be directed at a specific military objective or attacks which employ a method or means of combat with effects that cannot be limited. As seen in the Syria, Syria example, this prohibition does not always bear out in reality. Um, also present in additional protocol one, uh, there's a prohibition to excessive incidental loss of civilian life and injury to civilians. Um, but when you look, but that's specific to international armed conflict, looking at non-international armed conflict, 
additional protocol two merely provides some general norms that aim to protect the civilian population, including direct targeting, but uh, additional protocol two fails to prohibit indiscrimination attacks. So while these broad protections are necessary, they do fail to address the disproportionate impact on women as seen in the Syrian example. So by effectively ignoring the disproportionate effect on female civilians, although the Geneva Conventions aim to protect all civilians, women's specific needs as civilians continue to be effectively ignored. To reiterate, it's, more, it's important to remember that women are more than victims. Um, they are not merely passive, but even as civilians, they are actors within armed conflict and generally have some form of agency. Turning to women as mothers of the 42 provisions in the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols focusing on women, 19 of those 42 deal with women as mothers. For example, Article 23 provides that women, pregnant women and nursing mothers are given priority in humanitarian relief. Then Article 50 notes that, notes preferential measures for pregnant women and mothers of small children. Um, you also see these uh, protections for pregnant women and mothers of small children in the additional protocols. Under the enforcement critique, these protections reflect the protections necessary for women who are pregnant or, um, with infants or young children, as it recognizes the disproportionate burden that women have to protect and care for vulnerable members of the population, including children, or may be pregnant and therefore vulnerable themselves. Under the revision critique, however, while the protections themselves are not problematic, the special protections are based on a perceived physical and psychological weakness, reducing women to their reproductive and mothering functions rather than just protecting women in their own right. By lumping women in with their children, this effectively infantilizes women as well, equating them with their children. The socially constructed category of female is still more likely to be vulnerable, but these protections reduce women to their biology and ignores that being biologically female does not necessarily mean that a person will be a primary caregiver to a young child, which is merely a reflection of a gender norm of who cares for young children. While women do need special protections in consideration of their childbearing and mothering functions, these functions are only part of the extent of vulnerability of women in armed conflict, as women continue to be disadvantaged due to lack of access to healthcare and education. <clears throat> Poverty in particular, as women continue to be underpaid and undervalued, where 70% of those in poverty are women. Uh, women also experience limited mobility due to their societal caretaker roles and limited access to decision-making. Um, and therefore are unable to gain additional protections themselves. So it's generally uncontroverted that women experience sexual violence at a rate higher than men, including during armed conflict. The focus of IHL on women and sexual violence effectively ignores that sexual violence is also experienced by men. The list of gender-based abuses of women and girls in conflict is extensive. It includes rape, deliberate HIV AIDS infection, sexual mutilation, medical experimentation on reproductive organs, enslavement, sexual slavery, forced marriage, pregnancy complications following exposure to prohibited weapons, forced pregnancy and abortion, forced veiling, forced unveiling, trafficking, and forced prostitution. However, as such, it's necessary to protect women from these harms. However, the phrasing of the Geneva Conventions are problematic. For example, in the fourth Geneva Convention, Article 27, this refers to an attack on a woman's honor. This phrasing ignores the inherent right to dignity and instead carries value implications. The additional protocols do focus more on the underlying concept of human dignity referenced in the commentary particularly additional protocol, Article 4, which includes rape, enforced prostitution, or indecent assault within the category of outrages upon personal dignity. This concept of outrages upon personal dignity is also seen in the contemporary understandings of rape as a form of torture. Uh, interestingly here, torture, unlike other gender-based harms when it includes rape, is an, something states are obliged to prosecute. Looking at sexual violence through a 
and the concerns over framing sexual violence in terms of honor or dignity ignores the severe psychological and physical violence and impact of sexual violence. This also serves to frame sexual violence from a paternalistic view of protecting women's modesty and reinforces the view that a woman who has been raped is dishonorable. The 1958 commentary to the fourth Geneva Convention attempts to reframe the wording of these protections, particularly the references to honor and modesty as a respect for the absolute right to dignity. Ultimately, this commentary largely fails to adequately supersede the underlying discriminatory social norms that are present in the wording of the convention. Secondly, under this revisionist critique, the terminology used focuses on protecting women rather than actually prohibiting the acts of violence, which reinforces the perception of a lack of inherent value of women except by their relationships to men. Ultimately, by focusing on maternal or sexual harms, IHL marginalizes the role women may play outside of these capacities and serves to extend archaic and limited understandings of women and their bodies into the modern era. Under the enforcement critique, however, this critique argues that honor is more, of a, more than a word that indicates value, um, but rather that it reflects a code by which men and women may define their lives. Additionally, when considering the honor of women targeted during arm, armed conflict, the enforcement critique notes that it should be recognized that it is the perpetrator of sexual violence who is dishonored, not the woman. The terminology of protection encompasses the approach to IHL of prohibition and prevention. And this critique also notes that additional protocol one and two do explicitly prohibit sexual violence. Turning briefly to prosecution of sexual violence, the Geneva Conventions and additional protocol one contain lists of grave breaches that the state, states are obligated to investigate and prosecute. But these lists do not specifically include rape or sexual violence unless the act of rape or sexual violence amounts to a grave breach, such as torture, or inhuman treatment, or willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health. The understanding of sexual violence in IHL has effectively been supplemented by the realm statute of the ICC and then the tribunals, including ICTY, the ICTR, and the ICC which have enumerated additional war crimes of rape, sexual slavery, and forced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. As noted in the preamble of Protocol 2, human rights statutes concerning women may also be regarded as complementary to IHL, in particular, the Convention Against on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women explicitly addresses trafficking and exploitation of prostitution of women, which may occur in armed conflict. While there's continuing growing erosion of the boundaries between human rights and IHL, including by the international tribunals which are enforcing international criminal law. Human rights law is designed to operate in the legal relationship between a state and its citizens. And I, uh, international human rights law does contain derogable provisions and is not ultimately IHL. And while the two fields continue to be complementary, they must be recognized as ultimately distinct. The number of women in combat has continued to increase uh, across all types of armed groups. For example, some states until recently barred women from active participation in combat roles. This includes the US, which allowed women into all combat roles by 2015. And in the US where women make up about 15% of the military. Uh, this also includes Australia, which allowed women into all combat roles in 2016 and where women make up about 18% of the military. Another example is Israel, where approximately a third of Israeli soldiers are women. Additionally, in Nepal, Eritrea, and as I mentioned earlier, Sri Lanka, women have been a significant uh, portion of guerrilla forces. Interestingly, it has been suggested that increasing the number of women in military leadership may actually improve IHL compliance. This includes by making different proportionality uh, calculations that may protect more civilians. However, um, due to the lack of women in military leadership, uh, this is still hypothetical. So looking at women as combatants, formal equality continues to be reiterated through the requirement that all protections should be provided without any adverse distinction founded on sex. 
Interestingly, this also includes specific provisions for women in prisoner of war camps. Um, women taking active part in hostilities as combatants in international armed conflict are entitled to the same protections as men, particularly as prisoners of war. However, looking at non-international armed conflicts, combatants don't receive prisoner of war status, but all combatants, including women, are entitled to protections of additional protocol too, including a, a provision covering separate quartering of women. In the 1916 commentary to the Third Geneva Convention concerning Article 14, the authors explicitly distinguish how to regard women, or as they refer to them, the weaker sex, in three ways in particular. The first is weakness. Uh, this is related in terms of working conditions and food. The second is honor and modesty, which is framed in terms of defending women from sexual assault and abuse. And the third is pregnancy and childbirth, generally in reference to granting pregnant women and mothers of young children early repatriation. It's interesting to note that the 2020 commentary of the Third Geneva Convention on Article 14 takes care to note that the developments of understanding how combatants may have different needs, capacities, and perspectives means that Article 14 should actually be understood to that women have this distinct set of needs, um, that women face particular and uh, psychological risks, not that women are less capable, less resilient, or le have less agency which is implied by the 1916 commentary. Interestingly, Article 88 is one of the few articles that actively foresees women as active combatants, uh, distinguishing the experience of female combatants. And some scholars have noted that this creates a corresponding implication that the rest of the Geneva Conventions by using gender neutral language only speaks to men. Uh, for contrast, the full first line of the full Article 88 uh, refers to officers, non-commissioned officers, and men who are prisoners of war. Article 97, um, when looking at disciplinary punishment and separate confinement, the 1960 commentary notes that this is pr to protect the honor and modesty of women prisoners of war. Um, this is also interesting in that the 2020 commentary provides little insight over the intentions of protecting honor and modesty, unlike the commentary in reference to Article 14, and again fails to relate this back to a basic right to physical integrity or dignity. Post Abu Ghraib, in consideration of the right to be under the, under the immediate supervision of women, there has been some discussion about the sexualization of interrogation, particularly the element of potential humiliation and of male combatants being searched by female officers. Notably under the fourth Geneva Convention, there's no standard for searches for prisoners of war, although there is a standard for uh, searches for female civil internees. Under the revision critique, this generally shows that there's a need to reevaluate IHL in light of societal gender norms, both as it applies to men and as it applies to women. Under the enforcement critique overall, the legal norms that deal with the treatment of prisoners of war demands respect for their persons. So this would preclude gender humiliation. Overall, looking at women as combatants under the revisionist, revisionist lens, the references to honor and modesty ignore a woman's basic right to physical integrity. Additionally, it's worth noting that although women are theoretically protected from sexual violence as civilians, IHL fails to protect female combatants from sexual violence within their own armed group. Although many states have prohibitions against sexual abuses within their own military code, these protections have failed to adequately protect women and prevent violence which is a gap that IHL also fails to fill. Under the enforcement perspective, these protections are intended to ensure women receive equal treatment to men, as well as maintaining basic standards of care, including hygiene. This is intended to be universal across men and women. Um, when looking at the practical realities of armed conflict, a su female supervisor may be possible but ensuring searches by the appropriate sex becomes even more practically difficult. So in conclusion, enforcement, the enforcement perspective 
basically acknowledge, states that IHL addresses the needs of civilian women as well as women in combat, but ultimately requires more enforcement. Under the revisionist perspective, IHL is inherently discriminatory and while enforcement of existing provisions is necessary, these provisions and enforcement itself cannot overcome the underlying discrimination. However, both of these critiques agree that IHL might, must be accompanied by protecting women under international human rights law and refugee law, uh, that women's experiences in armed conflict are multifaceted and that women are more than victims and should be considered resilient. IHL does continue to develop both through academic debates and the implementation of more nuanced perspectives on gender in the international criminal courts. Interestingly, looking beyond conflict, um, in conflict resolution, when looking at what a meaningful participation of women in the post-conflict world should look like, the narrative revolves around incorporating women from civil society. The implications of the role women play in conflict resolution are then twofold. First, it assumes that those who are part of the warring factions are men. And second, this underscores the important impo importance that women, the ultimate importance that women play in achieving enduring peace as part of the community. Um, it's also worth noting, however, that female combatants, particularly women from rural communities, face additional post-conflict barriers when reintegrating, including exclusion from post-conflict government. When looking at IHL and considering the post-conflict goals, it may be worth looking at how IHL does serve or does not serve to protect women. Trying to find a middle ground between these two critiques is ultimately results in enforcing the existing norms while evaluating the Geneva Conventions to incorporate developing norms. Um, for example, you see this in the work being done in the UN Women, Peace and Security Agenda, which focuses on utilizing and expanding the multifaceted roles that women play in their communities in both peacetime and conflict. In IHL, there is the potential and possibility to better address the impact of conflict on women and reduce harmful stereotypes while still retaining the protections that exist. It still also must be recognized that IHL stops when conflict ends and issues like sexual violence don't end with conflict. And sexual violence is also usually a precursor to, to uh, indicate the start of conflict. So potential solutions that have also been proposed include new international standards on women in armed conflict. This may be a separate treaty or specific standards. For example, elevating rape to an atrocity without requiring some sort of analogy to torture or potentially a written reinterpretation with an updated gender perspective, sort of the work that you see beginning in the 2020 commentary. A gender equal approach is commendable and has its own benefits, but ultimately it does fail to recognize that there are inherent biases and an entire realm of violence that women are disproportionately exposed to in armed conflict. As these debates continue, it's important to reiterate again that women are more than victims. Um, reinterpretation and discussion of the law can only serve to benefit everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your interest, and I look forward to your questions. Hi, Catherine. Um, yes. Well, thank you so much. I first want to thank you for taking something that is, you know, very advanced level of IHL discussion within, mostly within, you know, uh, post uh, law school degrees such as LLM programs, and trying to break it down in something that was understandable for many of us who don't have um, a focus in that area or who do not have a legal background. So I think it's important for people to realize these discussions are happening um, and then they can do their own research post hearing what you're saying. So I wanna thank you for that and commend you on your ability to do so. Uh, we do have one question first in the chat and it's, um, do you think the best solutions for uh, these critique, feminist critiques of IHL um, are, are they best started at the national or international level? Um, I think as much as this might be an unsatisfactory answer, I think it's really a dual approach um, that I think ultimately it requires that states enact better legislation on their 
on a national level to ensure that those protections exist and start becoming more internalized norms while also recognizing that there's certainly an international component and that organizations like the ICRC do continue to push for better enforcement overall, um, as well as, which is also reflected in work, particularly through the United Nations. So I think it really takes a dual approach. All right. Um, let me see, is there uh, any other questions in the chat at this time? Is there a set of case law or any cases in front of international tribunals or even US courts that can be used as a basis for finding solutions? Yeah, so there's actually some really interesting work that had been done by the now outgoing prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, Prosecutor Bensuda, really dedicated most of her time to investigating sexual violence. Um, this includes her bringing gender-based crimes in three new cases um, with an expanded perspective on what gender violence can include. Uh, interestingly, there was also a recent uh, upheld conviction for a case that included rape and sexual slavery. Um, so I think looking even to the ICC and the very recent work of the ICC, I think there's a really strong basis for these protections and for finding solutions. All right. And then I'm going through the, the Q&A, so give me a second. Um, I see we have a raised hand from Jill Hoffman. Um, let me see if I can take her off mute. Jill, you should be off mute at this time. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Catherine. Amazing amount of information in a short period of time. Um, and I'm wondering if you, or maybe in future, if you can't do it this time, maybe in future talks, you could send the slides ahead because you pack so much information in such a short period of time that it's a little bit overwhelming. So I just wanted to share with you amazing information and thank you for focusing on women which uh, is not something that often is focused on when we talk about IHL, even though there's so many protections instituted within the Geneva Conventions and the articles and the protocols. So that's what I wanted to share. That's it. Thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, that's definitely something we can do in the future is share the slides ahead of time, especially when uh, we head into the more academic side of, of things. So thank you, Jill. Um, any other, the next question is, do you think that the proponents of the revision feminist critique to IHL would advocate for an entirely new set of Geneva Conventions or can it be supplemented with a new additional protocol? So I think what they're asking is, you know, um, what is the ultimate maybe codified solution to this or the suggested one on your end or according to the revisionists anyways? My perception is that a revisionist solution would in a in an ideal world um would like to see a redo of the geneva conventions um in particular sort of updating these were references to honor and modesty things that really distinguish women by more of a virtue virtue than actually as people um however i think my perception is also that the proponents of the revisionist critique would also be satisfied by a new additional protocol that takes care to distinguish how this protocol replaces or could be seen to replace the Geneva Conventions of 1949. All right, thank you for that. Um, let me keep going through the chat to see if there's anything else. Um, do you think proponents of the enforcement critique that you mentioned have an adequate strategy to improve the current laws on the, to improve the current laws on the books? So looking, I'm interpreting this sort of more in like a policy um, perspective. I think a lot of the discussions that are occurring and revolve around access to healthcare. 
um, in a lot of recent conflicts, you do see deliberate targeting of groups like Doctors Without Borders in conflict, which does have obviously a disproportionate uh, impact on the entire civilian population, but also has a disproportionate effect on women in particular. Um, there's also been discussions about in sort of an explicit recognition on the international level that IHL may supersede lower standards in countries in conflict. Um, again, this revolves generally around healthcare, including reproductive care. Um, and then another issue is actually ensuring that international institutions like the UN actually have some sort of operationalization or oper operatizing policies. So having a plan for implementing because words are great, but if you don't actually have an actionable plan, unfortunately, it often ends there. And then finally, ensuring that groups like the RC, ICRC are actively seeking out feedback. Um, a lot of times discussion happens um, without actually adequate feedback from those who are in conflict and those who are maybe on the ground and see implementation in a different way than just the academic perspective. Uh, yeah, excellent. Uh, well, Catherine, thank you so much. Um, I don't think I see, I'm gonna give it a second to see if anything else pops in the chat, but again, I wanna commend you on um, sharing this information with us. I know I have learned a lot. Uh, this isn't my area of expertise or focus. And so it's always great to walk away feeling fulfilled uh, from these educational webinars. Oh, there is one that just came in. Um, and the question is, uh, what are some good ways to get involved in this area of IHL slash and, in, and human rights law? And moving these areas of law in the right direction, be that from a revisionist perspective or an enforcement perspective. Um, um, so what are your recommendations on that front? So from like a really basic US perspective, you can always call your representatives, encourage them to be more cognizant of the law in general and how it may actually apply, especially when it is a conflict that the US is involved in in some format. Um, and then also can groups like the ICRC, um, ensure when they open up commentary or the UN opens up commentary, I know the um, ICC opens up uh, proposals to comments. So keeping an eye on when those occur and then not being afraid to share your voice, whether that's in support, ideally in support, or if it's something destructive, calling that out as destructive. Yeah, or just having uh, doing what you're doing now and also just opening the door to discussion um, and sharing both sides of you. It doesn't need to necessarily be in advocacy of one side or one perspective over the other. You know, a lot of change comes through uh, just having the discussion start somewhere. Um, and so, you know, that's what these webinars hope to achieve. And I think you're doing that with this presentation. Um, but, you know, I think. That was the last question I see that came in, um, but I want to thank you again for your time and thank you everyone for the time you've shared with us and I, we all hope that you've walked away having learned something. Again, if you have any further questions, um, please contact uh, the IHL point of contact at your regional Red Cross office if you want to learn more or get involved and become one of our volunteer instructors to teach IHL in your community. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Thank you again so much.